to the I Love Seville show. Thank you kindly for joining us on this network. Today's show is presented by the Clifton in Keswick. Memorable dining experience, happy hour, perfect for date nights, and man, their weddings, they do it top flight. The Clifton in Keswick, your choice for making memories, guys. So much to cover on today's show. Friend of the program, Peter Krebs, is in the house. This guy is well-read, well-informed, well-connected, and can communicate well with his message. And that, frankly, is a talk show host dream. Um, very much enjoy having him on the show. We'll welcome him to the program in a matter of moments. You, the viewer and listener, can chime in with perspective and help shape the discussion. We don't mind being challenged as long as it's in respectful fashion. Um, that's the only real rule we have on the show is, is just make it follow the golden rule. Um, Judah Wickhauer is our, nor our infrastructure North Star. Um, I'd be remiss not to highlight his talents. He's going on vacation next week, so you will see Joey Rifkin um, in, in an interim substitute director role next week. We will miss Judah, but he's recharging in the Outer Banks with his family. If we could go to uh, the studio cam and welcome Peter to the show. Peter, good to see you, my friend. Hey, it's great to be here and good to see you again. It's great to have you. Mm -hmm. um, how about an introduction to Peter Krebs, the man, and then we'll get to Peter Krebs, the professional. Okay, great. So um, I, I have the great privilege that there's a whole lot of overlap between Peter Krebs, the man, and Peter Krebs, the professional. Um, so I'm a Charlottesville resident, um, been here since uh, 2008. Um, my wife grew up in Fluvanna County, so I've been connected with the area really I won't say how long, because that'll tip off my age, perhaps. But um, yeah, so I'm an urban planner and community organizer for the Piedmont Environmental Council. Um, PC is celebrating its 50th year of uh, protecting the, the landscapes that make this place so great. And um, also by uh, working with communities to create high quality places to live in, in places like Charlottesville. We cover a nine county service area that goes from Loudoun County to um, Albemarle, sort of following the 29 and 15 corridor, um, this whole series of counties that sort of straddle urbanity, they've got mountains, rolling hills, um, just a, a whole lot to love. And so my role at PC is really on, on that second piece, working to uh, make quality communities to have a strong um, resident participation in planning processes. And uh, you touched a little bit on my, my core passion, which is uh, connecting communities, making places to walk, ride bikes, run, um, paddle, and especially close to home, so none of this stuff where we drive a long way to take a walk. I love it, I love it. Um, is it, do you guys prefer the acronym PC over PEC? It's PEC. Okay, PEC, mm -hmm. okay, fantastic. Yeah, um, and you might say the Piedmont Environmental Council. The, like I like it, with the, the article Ohio in front State of it. The University. I like yes, it, I yes, like exactly. it. The Piedmont Environmental Council. Exactly. All right, the first question's come in. It's come in from four different moms watching the program, and it's literally been the topic of conversation for a couple of weeks now. It's in every news outlet. Peter, the bus situation, um, county, city of Charlottesville. It's important to emphasize this is a nationwide problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just unique to Charlottesville, Namor County. Still, it doesn't make it any less difficult to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a father who watches this show, Kevin Higgins, lives in Greenwood, the, uh, the thriving suburb of Crozet, if you right. may. Um, and he said the buses in Greenwood are getting to school two hours late, mm. and they're getting the kids home two hours late. He did the math. He said if kids show up two hours late to school, they're literally missing one-third of a school year, which is scary wow. to, to put it in that term. Right. Open-ended question. Yep. Where do you want to go with this one? Okay. So um, before the show, um, you, you asked about my child. I've got a 19-year-old um, or 18, about to be 19, first year at JMU. So I'm a parent, first and foremost. So I, I definitely... Um, 
definitely understand a lot of what folks are going through. And um, I'm going to be uh, very, uh, I, I think, Frank, I always am honest, uh, that both Albemarle County and the city of Charlottesville are experiencing similar problems. Uh, I think over the last couple of weeks, the city of Charlottesville has gotten a little bit more attention uh, on this question because they're, they've been very proactive in uh, finding uh, different ways for kids to get to school. So I'm going to lay out uh, right from the top that um, both localities have a, a, a problem and the solution to that problem is not going to be the same in both Charlottesville and Albemarle. And um, how far they are along or how they're able to deal with it is not, is, is not the same in both localities. So this year I've paid a lot of attention to uh, what's happening in Charlottesville. I have a little bit more knowledge there. And so I'll focus on there while acknowledging that uh, I'd like to understand better the situation in Albemarle County. Started with Charlottesville because they actually approached us. Uh, when I say us, the Piedmont Mobility Alliance is a, um, a coalition of over 30 organizations that work together to promote walking, biking, and access to fresh air. So that includes uh, everything from the Mountain Bike Club to uh, the Rivanna Trails Foundation, we'll talk about them in a second. Um, Wegmans is a part of it. Uh, both hospitals are connected with it. So this really broad group. And they came to our April meeting and said, we anticipate a dire situation with bus drivers. Um, they, the city? The city of Charlottesville wow. was anticipating back in April a dire situation. Normally they have over 20 bus drivers pretty sure they were going to have less than 10. Yeah. They have six now. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, the number they give us then was seven. So it's even tighter than it is um, than it was then. And they approached us to help um, in two different ways. And they both relate to improving walkability. Number one is working uh, with the school district and the city to identify low-stress ways for kids to walk to school or to bike to school and then be a part of the solution to making sure those are really good. So temporary fixes at crosswalks, uh, expediting infrastructure and so forth. And then also to solve the problem Charlottesville has really, and I think this is the right way to go, used a very people-oriented approach. They mobilized lots of help. They went and got more crossing guards. Um, and uh, even- The walking bus. Walking school buses, yeah. which is where, where kids uh, walk together as a group with a uh, chaperone adult. And that's very important for a lot of residents because handing off their child is, is an extremely fraught thing. And you, many residents didn't want to just send their kid out the door and say, see you later. So in the city, at least, there are school staff literally going to neighborhoods to pick people up and walk them to school. It, it's quite um, amazing. And there are a lot of actual benefits to that besides um, not needing as many buses. Number one, the school staff is spending more time with the kids in their neighborhood. Uh, you know, the... Uh, bus drivers are great, but I would rather my child be with a teacher than in a school bus, 10 out of 10. Um, so uh, that, that they've been very proactive. So they came to me and i um, more knowledgeable. And that is sort of how the Mobility Alliance works. We work with groups who, who are, are trying, to, um, uh, trying to make something better. This uh, solution has not worked for every parent. There are uh, parents who are uh, driving their kids instead of walking. Um, and there are also uh, parents who would frankly rather have the school bus. And I can't speak to uh, how the district is doing, um, but I, I've liked their approach. and. 
Uh, one other thing that I'll say about Charlottesville before I move over to Albemarle is that uh, as of last year, Charlottesville had among the fewest kids walking to school in the nation. Really? It, it was not like we were an average district asking something extraordinary. The, the walk zone increase simply took Charlottesville somewhere close to average. So um, although there are hardships, what the city is doing is now similar to what's happening in other parts of the country. And honestly, it looks a lot like how it was when I was growing up or a lot of my peers. But folks built their lives around having the school bus be readily available. Folks, you know, scheduled jobs and, and stuff like that. So it hasn't been easy, but I'm very confident that... Um, that will come through on the other side with healthier kids, less stressed out kids, and um, hopefully better educated kids. Fantastic so, take, Peter. Yeah, so that's the city of Charlottesville. I'd be very interested to... Uh, Almoral's tougher because it's a larger footprint. It's a larger footprint, and it's not necessarily um, organized in ways that are walkable. Well so, said. So, uh, first of all, there are people who live physically far away from schools in Albemarle across the, the district. But I mean, so one of the parents that chimed in was atop Afton Mountain. Right. And so, there's two working parents that had to leave, the, one of them in a hospital scenario, where the hours are 12-hour shifts, right. very different than the 9 to 5. Yep. And another one that was um, a, a manager, I won't say where, that had to unlock the doors for the staff to get in mm -hmm. so he could not be late. Right. And the kids atop Afton Mountain here. Right. So Afton Mountain, Greenwood, I mean... You know, Greenwood's not walkable. There are so many great things about Greenwood, so beautiful and historic, but, you know, it's not small. But even, even in our urban areas, uh, I think a lot about, like, uh, hydraulic. Um, uh, we, we have a, a cluster of three schools right on hydraulic. There are people that live nearby, Commonwealth, for example, right there but the infrastructure is not um it's a dangerous road it, yes it's 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 not necessarily up to uh most parents expectations i think it it's safe to say that without you know hating on our counterparts who are working real hard to make it better so uh, a lot of work to do even in the county's urban areas so you you gosh he's good um i love this guy so What's the solution here? I mean, the obvious one is to pay bus drivers a living wage so we can attract more drivers. Mm -hmm. um, we try to highlight that on this show. Um, Charlottesville City school bus driver pay is less than 17 bucks an hour. Mm. Um, a lot of them also aged out or retired during the pandemic. Right. We've heard of the unruly, almost incorrigible behavior of some students on the buses, right. which makes quality of life at work pretty tough for the drivers. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the concern that's come with some of the drivers with, you know, we're call it endemic. COVID is still very much a reality for us, where you have 25, 30 kids and one driver in a tin can and inhaling the, the air right. has made some nervous as well. What do we do here? What's the solution? Right, so, so I think um, the true long-term way to not have this kind of situation happen over and over is to not have so many people living in places where they're car dependent. Um, so, uh, but failing that, that, obviously that's something I'm extremely passionate about. In, in the uh, short, shorter term, right? Like in the next couple years, it, it just seems like there needs to be some kind of reset uh, within that. That um, number one, the the labor work conditions pay piece. I'm not a labor economist, so yeah, I I don't know if I don't know if it's right how it is, 
but it seems like there is a problem. And number two, also uh, having buses that are, are less uh, crowded. Yeah. So, so to me, that would speak to having a little more resources toward the student transportation, both on the labor side, but also on the, the side of the rolling stock, having more buses on That's the road. That's tough because of what you stand for with the more vehicles on the road. Right. So, so I would much prefer uh, far fewer people walking. And so I, I, I'm sorry. You want That's more. That's crazy. Yeah. More people walking. Right. Fewer people driving. Right. And uh, focusing future growth in those places. Um, we Folks live on, you know, Afton Mountain. Folks live in, in Greenwood. I, I, I can completely appreciate why. But as we're adding new housing, it has to be in walkable um, compact areas that are well connected. Cool. We'll highlight some of the viewers and listeners that are watching the show. Allie Hill is giving you some props right now. Hey, Allie. Um, welcome to the program, Allie. We love when you watch the program. Spencer over here in Belmont. Grayson on the broadcast. I see our friends in Richmond and Lynchburg and Northern Virginia and North Carolina and Crozet on our heat map as we speak. Um, Peter Krebs, our guest guy, is just a fantastic human. Um, a couple more on the bus driver scenario. Um, John Blair, who watches the program all the time, mentioned that when his father was in school, they had um, student drivers of buses hmm. in the 60s and 70s. Okay. The school systems picked very mature kids, um, trained them in the first semester to get a CDL, and by second semester... They were driving buses um, and students to and from school. So that's a scenario and um, one I'd like to highlight. I'd love to ask you about how bicycles could potentially be a solution for this, um, along with walking. Could the, the school systems at all offer bikes for kids to solve a problem? So I, I love everything that, that uh, you said, and, and the answer is yes. The um, Charlottesville, uh, had, as part of their efforts, did connect uh, people with community bikes. So having um, uh, actual, you know, bicycles with locks and lights and everything needed to to make that happen, providing helmets and. Um, the, the city schools also have uh, a bicycling as part of their PE curriculum. So learning how to use a bike, learning how to operate it uh, safely. Um, now, I, I just said that I have an 18-year-old. So I'm not so sure about, um, no shade on him, but I'm not so sure about that kid driving a bus. But um, you actually slid on something that is, I think, super important. Uh, we're not getting stuck on that example, and I don't think you meant for that to be a specific thing. But your broader message is that uh, we've been educating kids for a long time, or more than a century. And this situation that we have is, is a pretty new thing. I think we really need to look to the past to... Um, uh, find answers to a lot of these questions. You cited a, a great example. And, you know, I, I talk, uh, um, I mentioned before about how it used to be quite normal to, to walk a mile plus to get to school. And so I, I think we're, we're going to uh, have a situation that's always evolving, but where we land is going to include completely new ideas, but also bringing back some things that worked in the past, like having walking school safety patrols is another example that I've heard that's sort of similar to the one that you raised. Yeah, Judah Wickhauer has been a huge proponent of, of walking to school um, and kids getting out walking to school. And if you want to chime in at all, J Dobbs, give us a three shot and we'll get you in the mix because your perspective is valued here. Um, couple more on the bus scenario. This guy knows what's up here, especially with the city. The hiring is done by not the school system in the city. Mm -hmm. The hiring is done by CAT. Right. 
which it's important to emphasize because that's a very different scenario than in Almoral County, where the hiring for the drivers is done by the actual school system. So the accountability in the city for this predicament is not necessarily accountability toward the school system in Charlottesville, where some of the accountability in the county could be directed more toward the school system because they're doing the actual hiring. And I also want to emphasize this. We had a bus driver on the show in Almoral County um, that was a driver seven or eight years ago. And she highlighted that the bus driver shortage was a problem seven or eight years ago. And we knew seven or eight years ago that the drivers were telling the county that they were going to retire. Mm -hmm. So this predicament is not anything new. It, didn't just, it wasn't just a light switch that happened. No, no. I think it was a situation, and we've seen a lot of this actually, and especially in the schools, where there have been systems running under a high amount of stress, sort of held together by scotch tape. And um, I, I tried to put a Band-Aid on my elbow with, with a little bit of tape, and it worked until I bent my elbow, and then it popped out, right? So, so I think um, we, we have to take this, this stuff uh, seriously. Like, drivers have been uh, many times, you mentioned retirees, but also juggling multiple careers. And... Uh, you know, doing it out of a, in a lot of cases, a sense of public service, but, you know, not being compensated uh, other than with their, you know, pure love of kids, which if you've been in a tight space with a bunch of kids, oh. it's not always all that rewarding. Let's <laughs> just say that, say that safely again, knowing that I, you know, I'm a parent and I love kids, but let's be real. It's not always right. that awesome to be with them. I mean, let's um, put it, let's put it this way. Yeah. My son in a, in a car for a long period of time. Right. Right. And I love this kid. Right. <gasps> yeah. So, so, we, we have to take the transportation piece really seriously. It can't be like a, you know, taped on type of scenario. And this is just my own personal uh, feeling. PC doesn't have a uh, really a position on this next thing. But, you know, you mentioned the multiple ways that localities are, are getting buses and Accountability is complicated. Uh, I'm all for regional transportation and regional cooperation. Me too, man. It just seems like there's a lot of economies of scale that the city and county could realize uh, by working together. Yeah, the, amen. Yeah. And Kevin Higgins in Greenwood has a comment for you that I'm going to relay to you in a matter of moments. We've dubbed him the mayor of Greenwood. He's just a great guy. Mm -hmm. The economies of scale associated with maybe you call it the Central Virginia Transportation System, the CVTS, it would, it would um, create more innovation possibilities. You'd have the same back-end infrastructure. You, you would have less tax dollars utilized. You would have more robust routes, potentially routes that are more on time with their buses. Um, and the benefit would be for all of us from a taxpayer standpoint and a quality of life standpoint. Currently, you have Charlottesville Almore Transit. I'm just rattling them off. You know more about this than I do. You have CAT. You got Jaunt. You got UTS. You got Almore County has a bus fleet. Um, why don't we just unify this under one umbrella? Ted Reek, who's come on this show, right. the, the CEO of Jaunt, when I started talking like this, his eyes were lighting up in pure joy. Right. Well, it, funny you should mention that, and in fact, uh, that made me think of something I'll get to in just a second, but actually uh, the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission, which is uh, the uh, regional organization that covers five counties surrounding Charlottesville, is uh, they just finished uh, doing community engagement surveys and stuff for something called the Regional Transit Vision, which uh, really looks all the way from Buckingham up to Greene County and then all the way from Afton to Louisa, uh, but concentrating on the, on the urban area about how to consolidate routes um, how to um, best serve the community. So, for example, you might have heard that 
Albemarle County is uh, piloting on-demand transit in Pantops and the 29 North area. So folks that live in neighborhoods could use transit to get from their, you know, their single family house to a shopping center. Not through a big bus, but through like a, a rideshare type thing that's run by the transit service. Um, it, it's, it's really looking at the cat routes, but it's also looking at these sort of um, shuttle services like the Afton Express, like the Buckingham Express, and looking at them all as a whole system. So the work they've done uh, so far has been on routes and frequency of service. Their next step is a transit governance study, which is looking at how transit is managed. And that could lead to a regional transit authority or some kind of overall uh, regional governance structure, potentially a reorganization of the different groups. Uh, the work to determine where that ought to go is still to be done. But I think it's super exciting. It, it, I mean, for an outside, of course there are reasons, but for an outsider, it, it seems kind of strange that there'd be a, a UTS bus and a cat bus sort of queued up on the same street. Yeah. You know, why, why wouldn't they all be the same? There, there are reasons, but let's work through the solutions. But the thing that, that hopped in my mind is with this regional transit vision plan and the governance study, why not have student transportation be a piece of that? Right. Uh, it, student transportation is a major piece of what CAT is about. Uh, I mean, it's understandable that little Charlottesville city schools would not, you know, run its own sort of bus fleet when there is a, a transit authority. Why not have it be... Um, Holistic. After all, a lot of Albemarle County kids go to Burley, right here in Charlottesville. Um, a lot of Charlottesville kids go to KTAC. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great, great approach. Peter Krebs dropping mm -hmm. knowledge here. Yeah. Comments coming in. So you, the viewer and listener guys, can help shape the discussion by offering your comments and thoughts in the comment section anywhere you're watching on social media. We have software that aggregates those comments so I can relay them live on air. This is from Greenwood. Um, he says, for Peter, I think it's time we succumb to growth and consider an HOV laid in certain areas. I-64 to Crozet may need that. And he says, Crozet has a company that does autonomous vans. That company should be all over this bus problem. I know it's scary, but maybe it's time to consider that. Then also, so that's for you, and then also, this is from Leslie, who's watching in Keswick. She says, Jerry, people made a big deal on a show earlier this week about seniors in high school driving school buses around, but please realize first years at the University of Virginia, which are just months apart in age, are driving college students around. Um, so... Two topics for you there, Peter. Yeah, so I, I have to confess that I sold my own son short a little bit ago. He's he's extremely responsible. And um, yes, uh, so working with uh, UVA on transportation issues, I've been fortunate to meet quite a few student UTS drivers. So and they're I'm not throwing shade at them. They're, right, they're you legit. Know, you're right. I, I mean, you, you think about the many, many ways that we give tremendous amount of responsibility to an uh, 18 or 19 year old. They can fight we, fires. I, I, they can fight wars. They can fight wars <laughs> they, and fires. Yeah, right. So, yes. Yeah, so, so I think that, that's an incredible point. Um, and there may be flexibility on schedules right. that may be not necessarily there for a parent or someone who's further along in, in their life. Um, uh, as to the uh, uh, getting people to move more uh, quickly down 64, I, I will say that Albemarle County is pretty excited about a, a new park and ride facility that will be happening at the Crozet exit um, to 64. 
So I mentioned a, a second ago about the, uh, the Afton Express. That's going to stop at the park and ride uh, lot uh, on uh, 250 and, and pick people up. So rather than having a bunch of people in um, individual cars driving on 64, I would rather them be taking buses that are running frequently and predictably enough to actually make sense for people to use those as a choice. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues at PC actually, um, his name's Don, he lives in Crozet, he takes the, the bus. So, um, James, it's a great example. James Watson, watching the program, giving you props. Hey, James. James is great people. He said, I recently dropped my wife off at the Amtrak station, and I noticed people sitting outside in the sun where you enter the large parking lot. I asked them if they were waiting for a bus, and they said that they were waiting for the Greyhound. Seems like somebody could work out an agreement between Greyhound and Amtrak so that they could share the station. I'm guessing if UVA students used the Greyhound, this would have already happened. And he's right. The Greyhound bus stop on West Main is no more. So people that are spending hours mm -hmm. literally on the side of the street on asphalt. Remember, they used to have to wait on Ridge Street. Right? Yes. Yeah. So that's a great point right there from James. Absolutely. Um, anything else you want to you touch on when it comes to the buses or kids in school, the hot topic of the... The community here. Um, no, but um, what I, uh, I'll just close with saying that um, kids walk into school, you know, we're, we're trying to get every kid 60 minutes of act, active, you know, fresh air. And when they're walking to school, they're more than halfway there just before they even walk in the school door. Big advocate for, for recess as well, but we know kids that move more are going to be healthier and they're going to have better grades and better outcomes. Well said, Thomas Long, watching in the Greenbrier neighborhood. Um, Jerry, I know you mentioned kids biking to school, and I'm all for exercise and getting them outside of the house and out of my hair, um, but the bike lanes in the city aren't always the safest. Can you ask your guests to grade the bike infrastructure, and I think by infrastructure he means bike lanes and safety, in the city of Charlottesville, and then take it to another level, ask them about Almoro County, which I would imagine is much worse? Um, Good question. Right, so I, I guess I would, it's all relative, of course, um, but I would say it's way below standard. We have a lot of work to do, <laughs> you know. Uh, what kind of grade does a, uh, a teacher give to a kid that you know they can do much better and they're not there yet? Yeah, we'll say it's below a C. I'll leave it at that. City? Um, uh, for the city, for okay. sure. County? And so Albemarle County, um, I don't want to paint the entire county with the same brush because uh, Albemarle is, is great because they, there is uh, countryside, which is you know, agricultural and forests and rural, and that needs a very different type of infrastructure or maybe far less infrastructure than the, the sort of very vibrant neighborhoods in Albemarle County. So uh, we talk all the time about sort of the urban areas of Albemarle County. And it, it, they are urban, and if we're going to talk about them in that way, they should have a more uh, urban style of uh, uh, bicycle and um, pedestrian safety measures. Albemarle County, I, I think I would, as far as where they are, I would also give them a below C grade. But I do really think it's important to acknowledge that Albemarle is working hard. So I, I give them a, a B probably for effort. They're, for example, um, I, I've been calling forever for there to be sidewalks on the eastern section of Rio Road. Not talking about the, the weird S-curve on Rio, but up around, um, uh, up closer to the John Warner Parkway, tons of people live there, and there are sidewalks going in there. I, I really have to acknowledge that. But there's so much, um, so much work to do. Um, back to the, the Greenbrier guest, uh, or the Greenbrier caller or yeah, emailer. Yeah, commenter, yeah. Uh, commenter. Um, 
There, the city does have a project that is pretty, uh, pretty exciting, actually, to connect uh, along the um, Meadow Creek Stream Valley from Greenbrier Park, really, uh, all the way along the creek over to Greenbrier Drive in the county over where Java, uh, yeah, where Java is and um, uh, the senior center used to be. Sure. Uh, then also following down uh, the stream valley toward uh, hydraulic and, and Whole Foods. What that will mean is that uh, folks that live, for example, on Mickey Drive, and a lot of kids and families live on Mickey Drive, will be able to easily follow a low-stress, forested, 10 feet wide, flat trail from there to Greenbrier Elementary School. Or if you live over by Greenbrier Elementary School, you'll be able to take that same path to Walker or to CHS. Well said. Um, the, the sad thing is that uh, this stuff just takes a really long time, and we have to be patient and urgent at the same time. Uh, Peter Karev's crushing it right now. Uh, let's get to some uh, topics with, with the Piedmont Environmental Council and topics that they are spearhead, spearheading. Um, why don't we go um, Loop DeVille? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. I brought you a present. Jerry. Ooh, a poster. Yes, a poster. I love the graphic design. It's so good. Yeah. I've hung a lot of posters over the last couple of years. Thank and this you. is the first one that people actually want to pay for. Right. You, you, you carry the show? Yeah. So, so the Loop DeVille Festival is coming up this weekend. It's uh, two days of hiking, running, uh, this is awesome. Biking, uh, picking up trash along the Rivanna Trail. Uh, two days of celebrating, um, parties on both days. Saturday is National Public Lands Day. Okay. And there will be a hike, a group run, and a group bike ride around the full loop of the Rivanna Trail. Now, the I talked before about different groups working together. This is a great example of that. And they've really upped their game this time, besides you saw the quality of the poster. Yeah. But they're also going to have aid stations along the route that will hand out water and snacks and stuff. And even sort of bailouts if people find themselves no longer, you know, maybe they overestimated their tired. ability. They're tired. Yeah. They just need a ride home. So that's going to be provided. That's all on Saturday, and it finishes with the Rivanna Roots concert. That I don't know if you've been there. It's pretty cool at the Rivanna oh, yeah. River Company. Yeah. They're having one of their concerts Saturday night. And then I'm super excited about what's happening on Sunday. Sunday is the 30th anniversary of the Rivanna Trail. And... Uh, on Sunday, there will be shorter walks, bikes, and uh, hikes as well. So, like, I believe a five-mile run, a just <laughs> walk that uh, they're calling the teddy bear walk, but they're not advertising it because they don't want kids to expect to receive a teddy bear, but short family walks on um, Sunday. And then also a more moderate uh, mountain bike ride, 15 miles on uh, what they call the River North Trail up by uh, Dunloran along the Rivanna River. Then from noon to five, it's going to be a big party at the Wolf Factory. Nice. Celebrating the Rivanna Trail's 30th birthday. Uh, Selvedge is going to have a special Rivanna Trail beer that they're releasing. There'll be music. Um, organizations, including PC, are having tents there. And, of course, it wouldn't be a birthday party without cake. So that's, it's going to be really fun. I, I can't wait. I had um, beers a bit ago with my friend Jim Hingley at mm -hmm. Selvage. Yeah. Um, that place is fantastic. And last time I went there was with my family, and we had lunch there and then enjoyed a hike on the trail directly behind the Wolf Factory. Yeah. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yeah, and... Um, so, uh, and we brought our four-year-old. 
So I want to highlight this for the families that are watching. It, it, it's, it was doable for our son. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's so good uh, down there. It's sort of a, a hidden um, gym, but more and more people are, are finding their way down there. And, you know, this is uh, where I have to say that uh, the county gets a high grade for effort because they were so smart uh, when they were creating the, um, uh, when the Wolf Factory was being created, uh, the developer and the folks from Willow Tree worked very closely with the county and they used economic development funds to build that pedestrian bridge that connects the last broken link in the Rivanna Trail. So it's this Loop de Ville on, you know, almost entirely wooded trails would not be possible without that bridge, thanks to Albemarle County. So we think about the Rivanna Trail as the Charlottesville thing, and it is mainly in Charlottesville, but the Wolf Factory is Albemarle County. Right and over the line. Right over the line. Right. And uh, so this is why, you know, yet another example of uh, working together, bringing really good dividends for the community. Very well said. Um, this question's come in um, from Spencer. Please ask the guests what the Rivanna Trail Foundation does and its mission. So... Uh, um, I don't have the ability to recite the mission statement off the top of my head, but the Rivanna Trails Foundation created uh, the Rivanna Trail as a, a sort of Appalachian Trail style um, experience right in the backyards of Charlottesville. Literally, uh, some of it is in the backyards where landowners have granted easements for it. It, I mean, talk about a collective effort. Um, it's dozens of landowners have, have um, donated easements for this trail. So the foundation uh, works to maintain the trail. Every foundation board member leads trail work parties. They maintain the trail um, but they also work to make the trail more accessible. Maintenance, uh, as uh, shouldn't be a huge surprise, it's really number one for driving accessibility. Like, uh, if a trail is well maintained, many people will use it. But they go much further than that. Uh, they work to create signage um, along the trail, but also they work actively to uh, balance the original intent of having a Appalachian type experience in the backyard while also having options for folks that don't want rugged terrain. So um, uh, the Rivenna Trails Foundation needs um, volunteers and they're actually recruiting board members right now, sort of that's the part of their season cycle where they are. So um, you can find out more about them at rivanatrails.org. Fantastic. Um, Peter Krebs, the Fifeville Trail opening. Yeah, so uh, I couldn't be <laughs> more excited about having two of my favorite trails having big celebrations in the next couple of weeks. So the Fifeville Trail is a new trail that was uh, really dreamed up by the uh, community leaders in Fifeville, the um, Neighborhood Association, uh, as the result of their work with the city to create a small area plan in Fifeville. Uh, the small area plan is a community vision of what their neighborhood ought to be like. So they were actually quite visionary, seeing changes coming to the city and in Fifeville, then the residents got out in front and said, this is the kind of future we would like for Fifeville. And one of the uh, major improvements they talked about, really two major improvements they talked about, was um, uh, connectivity and being able to get around safely. So we know horrible things have happened on, uh, on Fifth Street 
uh, making it safer to get around the community, but also better access to nature and easier, you know, uh, um, connectivity to the outdoors. So the the residents uh, came up with a pretty genius idea to work with uh, a private landowner to reopen a connection that historically existed between uh, uh, Tonsler Park and Greenstone on Fifth, which is um, you, it's in um, uh, sort of. Uh, also known as Prospect, a little yeah. subsection of Five Fill known as Prospect. So this path uh, is pretty short. It's only, I, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile to a half mile long, but it connects residents directly from Greenstone to the park. Historically, kids who lived in Greenstone could see uh, Tonsler Park from their windows, but they used to have to walk either out on Fifth Street, way out of their the long way, way, long way out yeah. of their way, or up to Cherry Avenue. Thanks to the landowner and the um, the residents, uh, there's now a connection. Now, my organization got involved in sort of the following way: they they had this idea to have this trail. And they had a lot of people who were willing to do work, but they needed more resources. So I've been working with the residents there, uh, and um, Anthony Woodard, who is the landowner, and others, uh, to design the trail. And then the Rivanna Trails Foundation, you know, just mentioned them, uh, applied to the Virginia Outdoors Foundation to apply for and receive about $25,000 to actually build the trail. So, so what we had was uh, neighborhood residents with a great idea, a lot of sweat equity and want to, a landowner who is willing, and PC, a, a catalyst, and then money to actually build the trail. This trail is having the ribbon cut in, not this coming Saturday, but a week from Saturday. So that's June the 1st. At October 1st. Uh, oh, sorry, October yeah. 1st. So yeah. I, yeah, I'm a child of summer. I'm always Me living too. in the summer. But October 1st, uh, 1115 at Tonsler Park. And uh, we're going to uh, cut the ribbon and welcome the community to the trail. And then, as a group, we're going to walk the trail up to the shops on Cherry Avenue, uh, right over by 9th Street. There's a, a barber shop that I actually go to there and a number of shops. And there'll be a community block party all afternoon. Awesome. And, yeah, so that's, that's all being led by the community, and it's so exciting to be a part of it. Your calendar is booked. Yeah, well, the next couple weeks, but it's all fun stuff. This is what I was talking about, having um, the work and passions all being connected. It's, it's such a treat. Now we have some updates as well mm -hmm. with the Three Notch Trail. Um, a three-notch trail update, my friend. A trail we all love. Also a baby of the Rivanna Trails Foundation. Right. Yes. Give us the, uh, the update if you could. Okay. So um, uh, just in case not everybody knows what it is, the three-notch trail is a concept to connect really Richmond all the way to Stanton via the ancient uh, three-notch trail slash three-notched road. Albemarle County uh, applied for a raise grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation this past spring to, for um, about $2 million to design the portion of that trail from Charlottesville to uh, the Afton Tunnel. Uh, this trail would be a wide shared-use path, sort of uh, based on and even um, not just based on we're seeing it as an extension of the Virginia Capitol Trail which is 
10 feet wide, paved, appropriate for walking, biking, pushing a stroller, rollerblading, whatever. So uh, Albemarle County is going to use this grant to uh, determine a route from Charlottesville to Afton via Crozet and uh, then also develop very advanced schematics for certain key segments of that trail. So then we could immediately uh, take advantage of some of the abundant transportation monies that are available. So um, it, it's incredibly exciting. And this is, I, uh, you mentioned that Ali Hill is, is watching the show. She is a huge champion uh, for this project. Um, she's not alone. There's a, a whole bunch of people who have worked on this, but she's been a real leader on this one. Tell us about Allie. Well, a Allie is a board member of the Rivanna Trails. Uh, she's a parent. Um, I, I try not to describe other people other than, you know, she's... Uh, a tremendous community advocate has, seems to have uh, boundless energy, is extremely kind, is a hard worker, and you know I think she's a great role model for other people to follow in how to make a difference in the community. Wow, Allie. Yeah. Um, sounds like we got to get you on the show, Allie. We um, do. If Peter speaks that highly of you, and he just did, you have yeah. an open invitation anytime you want, Allie. I sincerely mean that. Um, more questions coming in for Peter Krebs. Love Peter Krebs. Um, this is a very good question um, from Jason. Um, please ask the guest his favorite trails for mountain biking and if he does any mountain biking. Well, uh, so um, I do mountain bike. Uh, I, I'm sort of a person who rode bikes around the neighborhood as a kid and I never stopped doing that. I've always lived in cities and so... Um, I, I ride my bike to work and, and uh, uh, ride it around. In fact, many days I don't use my car at all. That's because of where I live, not because of who I am. It's, it's possible to do that living in Charlottesville. Uh, a couple years ago, I took up mountain biking because I work with mountain bikers all the time. I wanted to see what it was like for them, and it sounded pretty fun, and it's it is fun. fun. Yeah. yeah, it's so fun. Um, so uh, I, I think my, boy, that's a, it's a hard, hard question to answer in the right way. I, I would say that uh, in, the, in the whole planet, my, some of my favorite places to ride are actually in the Shenandoah Valley. There's the west face of um, Massanutten, George Washington National Forest. Uh, I like going to um, Pocahontas Park in Richmond, or just south of Richmond. There are a lot of great places to ride here in Charlottesville. A number of uh, uh, sections of the uh, Rivanna Trail itself are great for mountain biking. There's O Hill. Uh, just, That's a challenging one. Yeah, it's challenging. I mean, that, that big uh, hill being in its name should give some clue. Uh, for somebody that wants something a little bit less um, hilly, there's Pretty Creek Park in uh, Albemarle County. Actually, it's partly in Greene County, so that's a great place. Um, I went to Blue Ridge School this past weekend. That's great trails. Love it there. Yeah, yeah so there, there's a lot of great um, places to ride. The sort of gem of it all is going to be Biscay Run Park. When that place opens uh, in probably the fall of next year, it's going to, not immediately, because it'll be a work in progress, but when it reaches its um, peak, it's going to be as good or better than any of those resources. This guy knows Biscuit yeah. Run Park as well as anybody. Mm -hmm. um, give us uh, anywhere you want to go on Biscuit Run Park. I love when you came on last time, you put the size of Biscuit Run Park in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, Biscuit Run Park for some time has been in some kind of purgatory, if you may. Um, and we're approaching some actuality with this park from uh, an enjoyment standpoint. Anywhere you want to go on Biscuit Run Park. Yeah, so, so Biscuit Run is large enough that uh, lots of people will be able to go there and experience nature at the same time without being on top of each other. Um, 
we really saw in the pandemic how important it was to have uh, more places to go and also having places set up so we literally wouldn't be um, walking back and forth on the same trail and like running into each other all the time. Uh, so um, Biscuit Run will be able to accommodate walking, biking, other kinds of active recreation. Also large enough to have certain areas mainly left alone, not even used at all. Um, so that park is going to open in what they're calling phase one, that it will be a little bit minimal, mainly just a parking lot and trails. That's scheduled for the fall of 2023. It, it's my view and the view of a lot of other people that a park that is situated right in the urban area, adjacent to many neighborhoods, is, isn't really legitimate if you have to drive to get there. So my organization is working with the county and multiple neighborhood groups to connect Biscuit Run to the community in at least two separate ways. Number one, we've been working for quite some time to uh, create a uh, trail from Fifth Street Station along the Biscuit Run Stream Valley to the park. That, that trail exists and it's almost like turnkey situation, but it passes through private land. And I, I spoke a minute ago about how the Rivanna Trails uh, has permission from landowners, permanent permission to have a trail on their land. Albemarle County is working with the, the residents of the homeowners associations along the Avon Corridor to make available that land for an official county managed trail. My organization is also working with Albemarle County and Habitat and a number of other organizations to expedite an opening to the park over on Hickory Street. Yeah. Which would... By the police station. Uh, yes, but I'd say more like by um, uh, Covenant School. Okay, okay. Yeah, sort of behind Covenant at the bottom of the Southwood Hill. Okay. So we're incredibly excited about that. Uh, number one, because it'll connect Southwood residents to the park. And much like kids in Prospect can see Tonsler Park, but it used to be hard to get there, kids living in Southwood can see Biscuit Run, but it's hard to get there. We need to fix that situation. But also, um, many, many Albemarle County residents live down the Fifth Street Corridor or west of the park. They shouldn't have to drive to... Uh, uh, to Avon Street or to Route 20 to get to the park, having a western entrance to the park makes just a whole lot of sense. It is in the master plan. What my organization is doing is working with the county and residents to get it open much sooner. Great answer. Mm -hmm. um, hour, fly, hour and two minutes flies oh by with Peter Krebs. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to go, and I know you have a three you have to get ready for. We have one more show coming up, guys. What's Barking Local that spotlights the animal community? That's at three o'clock. I'd like to spend a couple more minutes with him because I find him incredibly fascinating. Here's an open-ended question for you to go anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. What would you like, and, and the Piedmont Environmental Council has a fantastic relationship with city leadership and county leadership. Mm -hmm. What would you like to see from city leadership and county mm -hmm. leadership what should be percolating, discussed at the water cooler, um, ways to improve the county and the city from a green space and an outdoor space standpoint? Yeah, so um, both the city and the county are, are in uh, comprehensive planning processes. The, the city uh, uh, last, around the turn of the year, um, uh, approved a comprehensive plan and now they're working on rezoning. The comprehensive plan talks about having uh, compact walkable communities uh, where it's easy to get around without a car. A lot of what the comprehensive plan depends on requires that walkability, requires that transit access, requires 
you know, bicycle infrastructure. The city really needs to focus, and they're, they're aware of it, but it always bears reminding, really need to focus on getting that walkability and bicycle and transit infrastructure in place ASAP. The city is um, in the process of hiring a transportation planner, which will be huge, and, and uh, they, they have already a bicycle, um, a safe routes to school coordinator. They also historically have had a bicycle pedestrian uh, coordinator. That position has been recreated and it needs to get filled. So I think the focus of the city needs to be getting staffed up so they can get to work on not only planning infrastructure, also getting the right project management assets in place so they can apply for these large amounts of transportation monies that are available and then execute well with um, monies they do receive. So that would be my ask for, for the city. And then also as we're in this rezoning process, um, as a secondary thing. The upzoning. Yeah. If you like, yeah, yeah. I, I think it could be it could be described as um, as upzoning, but um, upzoning is a specific term that that we uh, needs to be handled case by case. Uh, okay, upzoning is something that happens to a parcel, not to a city. Okay, so, having said that, um, uh, we need to both increase density and also increase tree cover at the same time. Uh, so that's going to be a... That's a, a challenge. That's a real challenge. Yeah. And that'll be, I, I think, a good segue to um, what has to happen in the county. Um, Albemarle County has done a, a good job compared to a lot of localities across America and in Virginia about concentrating uh, development and future growth within a defined urban area. Albemarle County has uh, two challenges. Number one, it needs to keep doing that and um, uh, have compact communities because it's game over for us all if we have sprawl. Transportation is the leading source of greenhouse gas, et cetera. So historically, Albemarle has been on the right uh, track in terms of uh, controlling sprawl. But then the other challenge of that is having those communities be highly livable places that people want to um, live in and enjoy high quality of life. As a little uh, subset, one of, the, one of the pieces that we're working on as an organization and, you know, talking to a lot of different partners is, is how can we help Albemarle County actually um, uh, fulfill the, the potential and the promise of the growth area, not only in terms of actually having growth happen there, because a lot of times developers are not even able to um, execute the, the density that the county has already authorized, but how to make those be really great places to live where, um, contrary to what we were talking about, it would be easy to walk to school or easy to ride a bike to the grocery or ride a bike to work. You're an interviewer's dream. Yeah, so. I sincerely mean that. Yeah, thank you. I love um, being here. It's so fun. It's, you're great. Um, Peter Krebs, guys, Piedmont Envir the Piedmont <laughs> Environmental Council. Um, I'm on their website, and I would encourage you to check it out, pecva.org. I'll give it to you guys again, pecva.org. They have an events tab on the website, and the events tab has all these cool happenings in one neat and organized place. Mm -hmm. It is a busy next couple of weeks um, around town. And it's busy, good busy. Um, ribbon cuttings and, and, and parties and Loop de Ville I'm particularly excited about. This is screaming my wife and son um, here from, a, from an engagement standpoint. 
I'm grateful for the time. Mm -hmm. Sincerely mean that. Um, and for those that are asking, the interview in totality will be archived on ilovesevil.com and wherever you get your podcasts. When you see Peter Krebs around town, stop him and say thank you. Say thank you to him. Um, Animal Connections, What's Barking Local is up in one hour and 20 minutes. I know I'm putting you in a tough spot here, but the man went really, was, was, was dropping knowledge today, so we went a little longer. Um, and at 3 o'clock, we're going to spotlight our animal community with the Charlottesville Animal SPCA on the show. We have a number of foster animals that we need, need to, another of, uh, excuse me, a number of adoptable animals that need forever homes. Let's help them do that, the SPCA. Tune in at 3 o'clock, guys. So long, everybody, and take care. Peter, that was awesome. Yeah, I, I'm jealous. You get animals in the studio? Uh, sometimes. Uh, they bring puppies. So great. Um, usually what we do is we show uh, 8 to 10 puppies, wow. 8 to 10 dogs that have been um, in, the, in the facility. The